So, today we have a special guest, Miguel de Casa, who is the creator of uh, Mono, Xamarin, Midnight Commander, Gnome, and many other cool uh, software projects. In the next hour, we are going to ask a lot of questions and discuss different topics about software development and technology. So, welcome, Miguel. Thank you for having me, folks. Thank you very much. Yeah, it's this very is probably the this is probably the easiest uh, uh, trip to Russia I've ever done. <laughs> Yeah, well, it's becoming Perfect. easier and easier these days. Uh, I mean, not the, the pandemic time, but in terms of visa and everything when we are in the normal time, but still, um, welcome to the conference and uh, thanks for joining us. It's early morning at your end, right? Right, yes, yes. I just got the kids ready. Uh, they're upstairs uh, doing home from, uh, doing school from home, but yeah. Okay, excellent. So so we have uh, we have some questions prepared already, of course, but uh, those mm -hmm. who are listening our broadcast, uh, you have a Telegram chat where you can type all your questions, preferably in English, but even if you do it in Russian, I will also be able to translate them and ask uh, Miguel. And also, mm -hmm. if we don't have enough time, then we have an option to continue after the official part in the Zoom where you can ask Miguel in the voice enable camera and finally shake virtual hands with him. So let's get started. And the first question is, um, so you, Miguel, uh, as Andre said, is uh, well known for creating tools like Midnight Commander, Gnome. Things are on the Linux world. And now at some point of time, not now, but back then, at some point of time in the history, you decided that, okay, there is a .NET thing from the Microsoft, a truly enterprise back then. So what made you to start thinking how to move this thing to Linux? You already had Java, which was cross-platform. Uh, maybe some other things which are cross-platform or thought to be like that. So what made you do this thing? That actually is a great question. Uh, and I've heard this uh, question before, but I think that you brought a really good point, which is why do this when there was something like Java? And I think that, you know, now I look at the calendar and, uh, you know, I'm on my late 40s, right? Uh, and I think a lot of me developers are a lot younger. They don't remember what the work was like at the time. So I think it's, it would be interesting to start by uh, realizing that when we started this project in 2000, late 2000, uh, a big machine, right? A, a big machine that people would have, uh, you know, well-equipped machine would have 64 megabytes of RAM. Uh, and these days we measure, you know, small computers come with eight gigabytes, which is way more memory than we could even dream of at the time. So I, I don't remember what my laptop had at the time, but it probably was 16 megabytes or 32 megabytes, something like that. Uh, the other thing to keep in mind is that Java at the time, uh, in, in 2000, was not open source. Uh, Java was free to use, right? You could download it, but there was no access to the source code. You couldn't modify it. And, uh, and at the time, I was very active in, in the open source community, and in particular with GNU, the GNU project, where we had spun off uh, this UI interface called GNOME. And one of the principles of free software, right, it was to have a fully open source project. And, and that meant that you could have access to the source, but also get the rights associated with the source. Uh, to me, it's, uh, and to me and the folks at the time, it was really important to create a, um, an asset for all of humanity, right? This is what open source is. Open source belongs to every one of us. So when I contribute code to open source, it belongs as much to you as it belongs to me. And you have the same rights that I have to do things with it, right? So you can make changes, modify it, uh, ship different versions and so on. So there was already a very popular system. There was Windows at the time. There was uh, the Mac, which was uh, on the fringes. There were various uh, closed uh, 
operating systems like Solaris was a popular one at the time, HPUX, OSF1, and a few others, right? But what we were building was a, a future where we thought that we could have a completely free operating system. And it was a little bit insane, right? You have to realize that at the time, Windows was absolutely dominant and the idea of building a whole operating system from scratch was seen as ridiculous. Um, Linux had had relatively modest success, a little bit of success on the server at this point. Uh, Red Hat had gone public. People were using it for serving uh, websites. This was the beginning of the internet. People were using it as a file sharing server. That's kind of how Linux got started. And, um, and uh, this is the era uh, when we started GNOME was 1997 or so, uh, even less memory than that. And uh, so th those were the humble beginnings, right? But we were building something out of a principle. And the principle was everything should be open source. And the problem at the time with Java was that Java was not open source. So we couldn't really build the future on a technology that did not set the same rules for everybody, right? Where Sun at the time had a privileged position over everybody else. So Java was out of the question. Um, in fact, years before Mono, uh, there were a couple of efforts to build an open source Java implementation. Uh, there was a Cafe virtual machine. There were probably there was a Jafar virtual machine from uh, the Hungry Programmers. Um, there were probably a couple of others too. And uh, and the challenge was always the UI, right? We we started the, with the VM, but the UI was challenging. And there was an attempt to clone AWT based on a separate toolkit called Bliss. Um, but the big problem that we had at the time, this is 1998 or 1999, was that because Java was free of cost, you could download it, uh, but you could not modify it, right? It was free, but not open source. Um, nobody contributed to these efforts. So these efforts were relatively small. Uh, they moved relatively, uh, you know, they did very little progress, right? So, so open source Java did not pick up enough momentum because there was a very good alternative in the form of the official version. Um, so that didn't take off, but we couldn't rely on it. And, uh, but it was very clear. It was very, very clear after years of writing desktop software for Linux that using C or C++ was very painful. And even when we launched the GNOME project in 1997, we knew that C and C++ were not ideal languages. And in fact, if you look at the launch, uh, the announcement of the GNOME project, you'll see that our intention was to use high-level programming languages. And, uh, and we initially suggested Scheme, which was a language of preference for the GNU project, uh, but we wanted to add other scripting languages. And that kind of became a thing, a theme around GNU, which is we want to raise the programming level and the abstractions. We don't want to use low level code. Um, of course, this being 1997 or 1998, the machines were not powerful enough, right? So I think the first scheme program that we wrote was a little UI for uh, for running ping and netstat. I think those were some of the first uh, early ones. And it was cute, right? It was built with GTK, it was written in Scheme, but it took about, if I remember correctly, it took about 17 seconds to launch, right? So we did try to use Scheme, but at the time it was not optimized. It was very, very slow. So we had to go back to C. So I think that if you download the first versions of GNOME, you'll still find the scheme code in there. Um, and you'll see that very quickly we had to rewrite it because it was just brutally slow. So you got to keep in mind that a lot of these things were developed in a world where the, the, the hardware was just not there, the memory wasn't there, the performance wasn't there. So we had to fall back to C. And the... Uh, and Mono essentially happens at a time when Microsoft announced uh, .NET. 
And .NET had a blend. Uh, it had a blend both of a high-level language, C Sharp, and the performance that we were looking for. And we know that the performance could be achieved with, uh, with things like Java. Um, uh, but .NET had made a couple of additional decisions at the time that were very helpful in terms of performance, right? The introduction of structs versus classes. Remember, this is 1990, <laughs> this is 2000. So these things matter at this point in time, right? These days, people don't care, but 20 years ago, it was a, a big difference, right? So we started, we started to explore whether we could implement this thing. And we did, uh, uh, you know, we did get some of the specs. The specs were incomplete. Uh, IBM was engaged in this process and uh, IBM and Microsoft were not exactly allies at the time, right? Or, you know, they saw each other with suspicion. So uh, IBM was participating on the ECMA process and they invited us, right? This tiny startup called Zimian at the time. Uh, they invited us to join the ECMA group as guests, as expert guests. And uh, we managed to get enough documentation out of ECMA that it allowed Mono to be implemented. Uh, well, I got the story a little bit wrong there in a few pieces, but uh, essentially we saw .NET as the high level language that we wanted to build desktop applications for Linux. And, uh, and that is how the, pro the project started. And it turns out that yes, it actually, it was very doable. Uh, we went on to use it extensively. And then there's all kinds of other things that happened later uh, that I'm not gonna go into, but, uh, but that's how we started. The essentially, we wanted better programming systems. Uh, Microsoft had that thing and, uh, and it met a need, right? It, it was the right language at the right time. I guess if you were to start things today, you probably could use JavaScript or you could use even Python, right? I mean, machines these days are so powerful that, that, uh, that, uh, that you probably, if you were starting the project today, you probably would make different choices. And, I think that .NET at the time was a great choice, but it turned out to be a very political one. It became very heavily politicized um, because you have to remember Microsoft 20 years ago was very much against open source. So while I think that technically it was a brilliant project and I have no regrets, uh, <laughs> you, know, I, you know, I went on to build a, 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 another company uh, with it. The, uh, it was very stressful because people people didn't want to be part of that thing, right? But the good news is that the people that did contributed heavily to Mono. So compared to open source Java, going back to your original question, uh, open source Java had failed to get traction in the open source community, but the dot, the community that built up around Mono was huge. We got contributors left and right. I mean, it was a massive influx of people contributing and uh, and building this thing up from the ground up. So it was incredible to witness. Uh, it was just amazing the response that we got. And then and then it got political a few years later, but that was a separate issue. So that's why we uh, that's why we chose .NET and not Java. It was not open source, and uh, this later changed, but by then it was too late. Uh, okay, uh, I have one more question about politics. And no, mm -hmm. actually I have a question about a pull request that I sent to Mono Project six years ago. It was, okay. a, very sm it was a very small pull request. I patched the stopwatch class uh, mm -hmm. and added uh, and handled a corner case when elapsed time is negative, I replaced it by zero. And I, uh -huh. I link original uh, Microsoft uh, source code from uh, reference source website and mm -hmm. s said, hey, they have this fix already. We should, we need this fix in Mono. But the pull request was closed by Marek Safar with a message, mm -hmm. uh, please don't link any Microsoft source code. Uh, so I reopened the issue, uh, reopened the pull request, and it uh, was finally merged uh, one year later by you, and it was already 2015, so we had some changes uh, in the relationships between Mono, Microsoft, and so on. 
So my question is about do not copy policy in Mono. So basically, mm -hmm. you could not steal code from Microsoft, but I guess it was pretty hard to implement some common methods in base class library. Uh, in most cases, we have just a single reasonable implementation that that is hard yes. to rewrite. So how you handled all these cases and can you tell us more about do not copy policy and uh, about your relationships with uh, Microsoft and the, uh, their attitude to, to the Mono project? Right, so I think the first one has to do with policy and you can trace back the policy to the GNU project, right? Remember, we were trying to build a public asset and you cannot just say, uh, you know, you cannot just take somebody's asset and make it public, right? You don't have that right. So, the, so it was very important for the GNU project and for ourselves to have a good pedigree. That means we built the code and we're building it out of public specifications. And in fact, one of the things that we did very early on the project was because people had a tendency to decompile and send us the code. So we insisted that first they would write the test suites, right? They would write the unit tests, testing the capabilities, and then they wrote the code, right? So that we could at least know that the person had actually exercised those things and uh, done that work. It is not bulletproof, but that was a good step to essentially weed out people that just use IL, whatever the decompiler at the time was. What was it called? Oh, it was a famous uh, reflector compiler at the time. Reflector, right? So, and uh, and uh, and sometimes you could see it. Sometimes people would send you patches with uh, I can't remember the names of virus, but it's like I one, I two, I three, I four, right? It was it was obviously decompiled. So the um, so we couldn't take that, and it was a policy of the project to not do that. Um, like I said, it's a policy that goes back to GNU. And in many scenarios, uh, our recommendation is we have a chance to do it better. So in some cases, we did a lot better. Uh, and in some cases, we just didn't have enough interest uh, for people to fix those things. And in those scenarios, you would see things that were not implemented. Right, so so there were many cases where either it was too complicated, there was not enough interest or not enough users or not enough demand, that the support and capability of Mono were very spotty. The more popular APIs got the you know got the best treatment, the best optimizations. The less popular ones sometimes were not implemented at all, right? So uh, you know that comes with the territory, and it's it's a little bit of a a, a built-in a built-in uh, uh, kind of customer research, right? Uh, you know, at Microsoft, you actually have to do customer research and you have to talk to customers and, you know, try to prioritize and, you know, assemble the data and put together a spreadsheet and, hey, people want this thing or they don't want this thing and so on. With open source, you kind of knew what people wanted and what people didn't want, right? So, for example, at one point, we thought, hey, WCF looks like a big thing, right? And, and we would bootstrap the WCF effort to some extent. And, uh, you know, it was used a little bit, but the more complicated pieces uh, were never implemented. And in many cases, nobody cared. Uh, so it turns out that there were a lot of things that were built into WCF that, that were only used by a handful of people. Um, so, so kind of open source gave you this, this view into what is actually useful and what is not useful, uh, which is challenging when you're replicating a whole framework because you don't have the data up front. Now, as for a relationship with Microsoft, it did change over the years, right? That was a very interesting thing. Um, Microsoft started the relationship with open source in a very antagonistic way. Uh, they saw it as a threat, right? They saw Linux as a threat uh, to their business. And this is before the cloud, right? Before people realized that, uh, that, that the old business models were on their way up anyways. Um, so it, 
so there were many changes. The first one was, I think, the ECMA process where more documentation was made available. The API documentation that Mono used for many years was actually based on the ECMA docs. So Microsoft had to relicense their documentation for public use. And we took that documentation that was public and we reformatted it for Mono. Here's a funny story for you. We wrote so many tools to import the ECMA docs, right? So Microsoft took whatever they had internally and they exported it into an XML format that they gave to ECMA. And then we took that ECMA thing and built a whole tooling system to document APIs. Uh, and we used that for all of our APIs and, uh, you know, we extended it, we drew it, uh, and so on and so forth. Years later, as our relationship with Microsoft improved, they did another export of that data, of their documentation, and they gave it to us, and we imported it into this XML file format, and we put it into the repo. And then, a few years later, time goes by, and the tools that they use to maintain and export their own documentation are lost or the people. Nobody knows how to get the documentation out. Uh, the tools are dead. Uh, the people are gone. So the only source of documentation that exists is the mono one. <laughs> so, uh, and we had imported all the .NET framework documentation. So we retrofitted the mono documentation back into Microsoft. <laughs> uh, in the last couple of years. And this led to an interesting uh, kerfuffle. There's an API in .NET called system.net.mail. And in my opinion, it, it was built probably by an intern over a summer. It's not very good. It's, it's kind of a toy API. And it probably worked for sending very simple emails, but it's, it's, it has design flaws. It has bugs limitations, uh, doesn't abide by modern standards, you know, everything that, you know, it's an email LPI that was suitable in, in 2002 or 2003. It wasn't suitable for the modern era with, uh, you know, secure security authentication, you know, uh, receipt validation, uh, attacks, mind handling, all that sort of thing. So we edited the documentation and we said, please do not use this thing. It's terrible. Use this other open source project called MailKit and MindKit that one of the mono contributors have written. And we put an obsolete tag there. And that's what our documentation stated. When Microsoft reimported the document, our documentation into the official documentation, of course, this became the official position, right? Because I had put that comment years ago. And and people were outraged, like, I've been using this API for years. Why are you forcing me to change it? This is, you can still find the issues on GitHub. <laughs> and it's like 300 comments or 200 comments. People are pretty upset that I deprecated that by, you know, honestly, it's broken. You shouldn't use it. But, uh, but that was a side effect of the documentation uh, making it back. So um, the interesting thing is that today, today, all the documentation that you see for .NET is based on that mono documentation system. And it has evolved, right? Now it supports many, many more things and it has more full-time people working on it. Uh, the original author of the mono documentation tool now works on mono for Android, but, um, but that tool that we had built uh, essentially became the, uh, the tool that powers Microsoft documentation now. So anyways, this is a long way of saying uh, we started with a, a tiny piece of collaboration like that. And then there were small efforts to open source technologies, uh, you know, various PMs and engineers in Microsoft would make the case that they needed to open source the technology so we could use them. And I don't know how they convinced management at the time, but things like the DLR, the dynamic language runtime, uh, things like uh, MEF, which I'm not a fan of math, but you know, it was one of the, the, the very first pieces that Microsoft open sourced. Um, chunks of ASP.NET, I can't remember what it was called, but they had a, 
some sort of ASP.NET extension, uh, a package of additional features that you could get. And Scott Guthrie at the time started to open source some of those. Then by 2007, um, at the height of the politics of Mono versus open source, the company I was working for, Novell, signed a patent license agreement with Microsoft, which was seen as a massive betrayal of the open source community. Um, and, uh, you know, that made everybody's lives miserable for years. The politics of it, the politics, you know, if, if you follow politics today, it was just as nasty. Uh, but it was, uh, instead of being in the world stage, it was the politics of software. And... Uh, I still thought that we need to use .NET to build desktop applications and Microsoft had come out with Silverlight. So uh, over a period of three weeks, and I documented in a blog called Silverlight in 21 Days, uh, a team of about 10 of us uh, in three weeks were re-implemented enough of Silverlight 2 uh, to have a proof of concept. And, uh, and it was fabulous. You should read the blog post because it was very exciting a time for all of us. And, and we did it because somebody in Microsoft France had not asked for permission. So somebody in Microsoft France said, hey, you know, uh, we know that you like Silverlight. Why don't you come to France and uh, do a keynote at the .NET event in France? I can't remember what it was called. Maybe it was called Remix. And I said, sure, I'll go. And uh, and my demo was essentially, we're going to re-implement Silverlight for Linux in three weeks. So we were I was still merging patches and fixes from my team. It was a team of about 10 people. Uh, I was merging changes like 20 minutes before I went on stage to show the airplane demo on stage and the video playback. Uh, and that led to a tighter collaboration to my, with Microsoft. So first of all, that guy, I think, got slapped in the hand for doing that. But... <laughs> Um, as part of the regular Microsoft and Novell meetings, we had a meeting with Bob Muglia and, uh, in the Novell offices, and I showed what we had done, and he was very impressed. Um, and we decided to sign a collaboration agreement. Um, and the collaboration agreement essentially said Microsoft will get, I mean, Novell would get audio, audio and video codecs, which it's... it's it's very important for Linux. It was very important for us. And it's a very complicated subject matter related to patents and licensing. So I'm not going to get into that. But we got that. We got the test suite for the core libraries of .NET. Anything that Silverlight used, we got test suites. right? So it was a way for us to validate Mono. And we fixed a ton of bugs in the runtime, the libraries, the classes, the Everything, because it was not just the UIPs, it was test suites for everything. And this was a process that took a couple of years, right? Microsoft was not ready to give out their internal test suites. And uh, not everybody was on board, but it was now a, an official signed agreement. And, uh, and that's how it happened. And then, uh, then .NET saw some darker days. Uh, I don't know if you remember this, but when Windows 8 came out, uh, kind of .NET was an afterthought, and Silverlight what had been deprecated, um, and we had found a new calling. So while Microsoft was pushing for Windows 8, we found that, well, .NET and Mono were heavily politicized in the open source world, that we could put .NET on the iPhone and Android, and those people they didn't care about the politics. Those people wanted to sell apps. And C Sharp is better than Objective C and better than Java. Um, so we essentially we essentially abandoned the open source world and started to sell a product for mobile. And my God, we had so much fun. So on the one hand, I love open source, but on the other hand, God, I love not having to deal with uh, people with very strong opinions. That, you know, stop energy, complaints, whining, personal attacks. So, God, I love those open source. I, I, I love that transition to closed source for so many reasons. It was delightful. Um, and that's, uh, you know, at that point, 
at that point, our relationship with Microsoft was very different. Um, later, Microsoft realized that .NET was key uh, for the success of Windows again. So it was kind of forgotten because they thought JavaScript was the future. And then it turns out that everybody loved .NET and uh, mobile was one of the components that, uh, that would help .NET remain relevant for a large portion of their users. So, so we started to collaborate more closely and, uh, and you know, our relation, we started to meet regularly with Microsoft people and engineers. And I don't remember all the details now, but, uh, but we had a back and a continuous back and forth with the, uh, with the folks in, 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 uh, in Microsoft and, uh, and at one point, the guy in charge of the cloud invited us to present to his whole staff. At the time, Bob Moulier had left, and it was Satya Nadella before he was CEO. So he invited us to present to his whole team, and, and we had a really good working relationship from that point on. Uh, and then he got appointed CEO, and then I was like, ah, oh, this is fantastic, right? Uh, we love that guy. So, um, so. Uh, so that's kind of the evolution of the Microsoft relationship with with Mono, and uh, and then of course they acquired us, and and, uh, and now Mono is part of .NET, uh, right? So it's a so it's a whole it's a whole it's a very different beast these days. Yeah, thanks for a very detailed story and a lot of historical perspective in it. <laughs> and we will get back to the Mono and .NET, but uh, before we go there and before we go mm -hmm. to Xamarin and, and uh, phones and everything, I want to ask one question. So yes. you mentioned that uh, your, one of your goals was to build desktop software for Linux. And uh, yes. my impression about Mono has always been that it is like purely like command line server side thing without any UI. And the only UI that exists on .NET is WinForms. Well, WPF later. So what was the UI story on Linux for the Mono and .NET? That is a great question. Yeah, so actually Mono did start entirely for supporting the GNOME desktop. And what we did is we bound, right? We created a .NET binding to the native API called GTK, which is what GNOME uses natively. And all of the GNOME API, so you have GTK Sharp and GNOME Sharp and all of these things. So this is what we used. And in the Novell era, right? Uh, we used it to build some of the key missing apps. No. Uh, it's snack. Sorry, that's those are my kids broadcasting. Um, the uh, so we're very proud. We we built like the photos replacement app. We built the music player. We built the search index app. We built our designer. We built our IDE. So we had uh, uh, we wrote our note taking app. Uh, we wrote six or seven apps, major desktop apps with Mono that shipped in the Novell Linux desktop. Um, Ubuntu shipped some of those. I think that Ubuntu did ship some of those. But like I said, it was a very heavily politicized thing. And, and there were always efforts to try to re-implement them in different languages so nobody would be contaminated by this uh, technology from Microsoft. So... Um, so while we built the apps uh, and they shipped in a few distributions, it was very political, very nasty uh, world. And they didn't see much success because of this very, very nasty politics at the time. Um, but we thought it was a success because nobody had written that many desktop apps for Linux. Now, this is a world, like I said, once we went to mobile, we really saw what the world could do, right? Because we were proud of seven apps. And within six months, you know, there were like 300 apps built with Mono for Mobile. And, you know, that ballooned. I, I mean, I lost count years ago, but that ballooned ever since, right? So, um, so it was very interesting because, like I said, we were very proud of seven apps. And then once we were proprietary to a platform that people needed to target, right? Uh, it just exploded. And, uh, you know, it's in, 
like you said, people associate .NET with server things because to a large extent, the Linux desktop is still not, you know, it's something that some professionals use, uh, you know, maybe industry, a few other folks, rendering folks, but um, it is still not a major uh, player on the desktop, right? So, so the kind of apps that you get are limited and if you're lucky, you get uh, Electron, right? And Electron-based apps these days. Uh, and it's kind of a afterthought, right? It's like, well, I built it on Electron, maybe it works on Linux. So, uh, you know, the Linux desktop is still not there. And, uh, and clearly mass market uh, operating systems like Android and iOS is, is where all the action is. And I'm sorry that I have the light to coming from the window right now here. So that's why I'm, I'm moving back and forth. So. Anyways, yes. So we were, we were, we had a toolkit, and uh, and we liked it. We tried to clone WinForms. That turned out to be a disaster. Well, not a disaster, but very, very tough, because cloning WinForms really needs you to clone Win32. Um, and you know, I wouldn't recommend it to anyone. <laughs> yeah, still, Microsoft did it in .NET five to some extent. Uh, then uh, the the similar question is that okay, we are talking about Linux, but uh, these days the Mac OS is also kind of plays significant role on the desktop. So what is the relation of Mono and Mac OS? It's basically this kind of the same Linux underneath, or it's almost the same, not exactly the Linux. No, that is a good question. Uh, that is a good question. Uh, and I have to say, the support that .NET added for WinForms, it's actually only on Windows, right? We were trying to put WinForms in other platforms. That's what makes it hard. No, on Mac, you have a different API. It's called AppKit. Um, and there's a bunch of other frameworks. But the core one that you use to build UIs is called AppKit. And we built a, essentially a binding to AppKit. Uh, it's called Xamarin.Mac. So if you get Visual Studio for Mac and, and you create a Mac project, you actually have to use the AppKit APIs. I mean, you don't have to, but if you want to build a native Mac app, that's how you do it. So essentially today, um, essentially today with .NET, um, I believe almost every platform that is out there has bindings to the native APIs. So you can always use the native API to target whatever is the host today. And, uh, and uh, there are efforts to do abstractions, right? And there's many of those um, that range from Avalonia, right? That's one end of the spectrum, all the way to Ito forms, to Xamarin forms, to uh, you know, other sorts of bindings, right? So, so there's a spectrum of options for people that want to write once and run anywhere with different trade-offs, or you can target directly the native API of every platform, right? So you, you can think of the AppKit bindings, uh, we call them Xamarin.Mac because it's more than AppKit, it's about you know, uh, 100 frameworks or 60 frameworks. Um, you can think of it like in the same way that you think about talking to DirectX, right? There's an API where you can talk to DirectX or OpenGL or Vulkan. Uh, and there are people that will want to use those low-level APIs or very native APIs. And there's people that just want to build something, you know, three layers higher, right? And it's like, hey, just put a cube on the screen. I don't care how you put it in, <laughs> right? Uh, or you can go the way down and, and you create your own vertices and your shaders and all that stuff. So it's really a choice that developers have today. And I'm sorry for these very long uh, answers. I'll try to make them shorter. No, no, it was very interesting. So we dis discussed uh, desktop uh, UI development, mm -hmm. and I want yes. to ask uh, you about mobile development and future of mobile mm -hmm. development. So currently yes. we have a lot of different technologies that allows developing mobile applications. Obviously we mm -hmm. have Xamarin, but we also have uh, some native tools to produce uh, mobile applications. We have JavaScript that can be wrapped into an application. We have uh, Kotlin native, we have Flutter, we have a lot of different frameworks, yep. tools, technologies. Uh, so what is your opinion about the future of mobile world and which technology will succeed and which technology should be used right now and what do you think about that? Uh, 
Well, it's a complicated answer. Um, I don't know that I have a blanket recommendation for people. And, and the reason is that all of these things come with trade-offs, right? And, and not everybody will have the same opinions. Like, for example, I'll give you, I'll give you an example. The, the Apple and iOS community are super, super, super um, uh, fans of, of using native APIs and creating super polished experiences and, you know, uh, and spending years developing these apps. But the problem is that not everybody has the time or budget expertise or needs to do that, right? So, so while it would be ideal to build things that way, it's not necessarily what people do, right? And this is where things like React Native come in. React Native works great if you're a web developer, if you have JavaScript experience, it has, uh, uh, or it, I haven't used it in a long time, but it, it had very good uh, uh, interactive mode of development. So, so even if Swift and Kotlin are fantastic, the, you, you know, you might not have access to Swift and Kotlin developers, right? Or, uh, or, or you might have, you know, third world countries, not everybody has a Mac, right? So you use cheaper PCs, you develop on you develop on a PC uh, against an Android device, and then you cross your fingers and and you get somebody else to do the iOS version, right? Um, so there's a lot of different trade-offs and constraints that people have, so it's difficult to choose one. I think that uh, I think that all of these frameworks have done a fantastic job, and and they're all growing to essentially uh, get more capabilities. Um, the, you know, I, I have not used the Kotlin native, but I can say, for example, Flutter is is doing a fantastic job of doing write ones from anywhere, but it comes with its own trade-offs, right? It's it's not exactly native. It looks sort of native, right? Uh, Integrating with native is not uh, a smooth ride, right? But for a lot of people, that is enough. Um, and the... Uh, and I think that the other piece that really carries a lot of weight is whether you have some code that you need to reuse. And this will drive probably a lot of your decisions, right? So if you have existing Java code or if you have existing .NET code or existing Objective-C code, it will drive a lot of your framework decisions more than, than other practicalities, right? So um, I don't know that one of them is going to win uh, just because... It's, it's a very vast, wide world uh, with so many different needs, uh, right? Uh, in, the, in the .NET world, we try to, like I said, target, give you access to the low level as well as abstractions, right? If I had unlimited budget, I'll be honest, I will do something like Flutter has done, which is have my own rendering system uh, not because I particularly like it, but because I know that users like it. Well, no, developers like it. I don't think users like it, but developers <laughs> like it. So, and I think that this is a gap in the story. But the challenge that I see is that it's incredibly expensive to build a Flutter-like system, um, and uh, I don't think I don't think we're going to see a Flutter clone, a, a, another version of Flutter anytime soon. It's just too expensive. Right, Avalonia is probably the closest that we have, but it is years away from the of solving some of the hard problems that Flutter has solved. Right. So, anyways, um, I'm afraid I cannot give you an answer. Uh, you know, of course, I have a very emotional attachment to .NET. I think it's fantastic, um, but uh, not everybody has the same needs, and and even in .NET, we don't satisfy all of the user needs or all of the user markets, right? So so I think that we've taken more of an approach. I mean, my uh, these days that I'm not working on .NET, it's easier to say that, right? But, uh, but uh, uh, there's not one solution for everybody. And, and you know, we're going to continue to see blog posts about you should use this or you should use that. Now, personally, I have to say, I enjoy tremendously uh, writing Swift code it's it's a very fun language to use, um, 
the problem is, of course, that you know Swift UI, which is the thing that I like, only runs on on Apple platforms. So it's really not suitable for for you know most of the world, right? Most of the world is on Android. So, but I have fun, and that's the kind of thing that I like. You know, when I have a free evening, that you know, if I'm not watching a Netflix show, I like to I like to play with that. So. Um, and I'm sure that there's something equivalent for Java, and uh, but you know, I don't really don't use Java. Isn't this story about Swift UI, Swift UI that runs only on uh, Mac, is kind of the same thing that happened 20 years ago when .NET ran only on Windows, and you took it and made it run on Linux? So somebody has to take something from Apple and run it, make it run on Android and Windows and everything else. Well, so I think that somebody should do it. Um, it's not going to be me, in part because now I have three kids, and, and my God, they, they don't let me breathe or think, right? So between having a job at Microsoft and having three kids, it's very, very tough. Uh, you know, it has to be somebody in his 20s uh, that uh, doesn't have kids that can, uh, you know, can go and do this. But I think it would be a great idea. Uh, uh, and actually, if somebody wants to work on that, I have some ideas on how to get it done, and I'll be very happy to coach somebody into doing it. I just won't do it myself. Um, but, uh, you know, I have a lot of ideas on how to do it. I just also think that it's it's a very long process, right? Um, there's good, there's, there's a very sweet uh, thing called Swift UI Web. Somebody essentially wrote a Swift UI I would call it implementation for the web that generates HTML. So that could be used as a foundation in terms of that's the engine. Somebody already figured out how the engine works uh, to bind it to something else that would paint on Android. And you know, if I were to do this, I would probably uh, use Flutter as the backend because it has the the rendering system closest to what Swift UI provides. Right. It's not exactly a good match, but it will get you in the right track. Um, and like I mentioned before about uh, Flutter versus Avalonia, these rendering engines are a lot more expensive and a lot more sophisticated than people uh, give them credit for. So if I were to do it, I would probably take SwiftUI Web and combine it with Flutter and build something like that to be cross-platform. But again, uh, I don't know if there's a need. I mean, some people seem to be happy with React Native and, and you know, so. Yeah, so now that we are talking about different kind of UIs, uh, there is mm -hmm. yet another thing to talk about this in the .NET area. Uh, now we've got uh, Xamarin Forms as a kind of an mm -hmm. official cross-platform thing from uh, Microsoft on .NET. We also mm -hmm. got Blazor, and we are mm -hmm. getting something about MAUI or whatever it's called. I'm not sure how it's pronounced correctly, the new Maui, Maui. Maui. Okay. So, yes. what uh, is it again? The, the, an attempt by Microsoft to make a, kind of a solutions for different segments, or they will join somehow together? Right. That's a good question. So, one of the so Blazor. I think that the Blazor model is a really interesting uh, programming model, and they've made it. Uh, they've made it quite nice. It's a server-based application model. Uh, retained state. It's useful for interactive applications, and and it works great. I mean, that's the web blazer. Um, so that grew out of a desire to 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 have a framework that was simpler to use for web developers. And I think what it has been surprising, really, is that what started as an experiment is probably one of the fastest growing. Uh, uh, web developer stacks for .NET. I mean, there's no question that Blazor is incredibly popular. I am, I am impressed by how quickly it has grown. And then we did a version of Blazor that, rather than relying on the server to do all of your logic, right? If if you have millions of clients, you don't want to scale up the server, right? So, so you want to run as much as possible on the client. So we did a version of that that runs on WebAssembly. And that one is also fairly popular. Uh, and that's what shipped in .NET 5. So in .NET 5, you get to choose 
whether your Blazor code, the majority of your code runs on the server or the client. That's really the difference. Um, so it's really been driven by an experiment that became really popular and people liked it and it became a product. So that's really where it comes from, right? Uh, ideas and experiments that are tried out and, and if people like them, then we'll continue developing those ideas and we graduate them into, into products. You'll see a few things like that right now, like the Kubernetes support, right? We're experimenting with different things and some of those might be useful and some of those might not. Blazor was one of those runaway successes. Um, Xamarin Forms in Maui, uh, essentially Maui, the way that they envisioned Maui was, let's take Xamarin Forms, which today works on Android and iOS. And officially, uh, so here's the, officially it supports Android and iOS and unofficially it has support for Windows, WPF, Mac, you know, all kinds of other things, but they're unofficial ports. And Maui was the effort to make all of those things official, right? And in the process, they said, well, what if we take this opportunity to go and fix a bunch of APIs that we don't like and, uh, you know, we'll make them better, right? So the so right now, to think of Maui just as the official version of Xamarin Forms, right, across all platforms. And perhaps, we don't know yet if it's going to happen, whether we might change some of the APIs to be better or not, right? On the one hand, if you make the APIs better, it's nicer. But on the other hand, it means that you have to essentially reboot the ecosystem, right? You need component vendors need to build new versions. People have to migrate their code. So there's, I, I, I actually lost track, so I don't know exactly where we are there. So I don't know exactly where we settle on what we're going to do with Maui in that particular uh, thing. So anyways, that's the story really. Maui is just Xamarin Forms uh, officially supporting all platforms. And I think that originally the plan was let's drop the Xamarin name, right? Like the namespace, the assembly, so that it's clear that it's cross-platform and it's part of .NET. And that's where the rebranding came into place. But then we realized, oh, hey, if we do this, then everybody has to change their projects. So there's a little bit of a friction there, right, to uh, uh, a marketing, uh, well, not marketing, but, you know, busy work that people will have to do. And that's really the difference between those two. We want, it's definitely going to get all the platforms. The question is, do we break people code or, or do we make it simple? So, so that's really the difference between those two. I'm sorry, I said I was going to make my answer short. Um, <laughs> You're doing a good job, no problem. <laughs> yeah, it was quite interesting. And we have only 20 minutes left, and I mm -hmm. want to discuss the present and your current life since you joined uh, Microsoft. Mm -hmm. uh, what exactly you do uh, right now, and what is your experience with Microsoft? Because you know, you're a, uh, a person with a heavy Linux background, and a lot of people from the Unix world don't really like uh, Microsoft. And is it okay for you to work there? And also, yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, as you know, Microsoft loves Linux now, right? Um, uh, I believe that our Azure. Uh, I mean, I don't know how much of this is confidential, so probably I shouldn't say much, but you know, Azure is very popular with Linux deployments, right? So it's a big component of what drives the, the cloud growth, right? We now have, uh, of course, uh, Surface Duo, which is a Linux-based phone, right? Uh, we have massive teams of people just working on Linux. And in fact, uh, the operating systems team, uh, you know, the core operating system theme actually handles both Windows and Linux. So we're essentially now a big Linux company, very big Linux company, although, you know, we sell Windows and we develop Windows and all of those things. But Linux is a force of nature. It's here to stay, right? Uh, we also have uh, uh, the Azure, uh, what is it called, uh, Sphere which is our uh, secure embedded operating system, right? It's all Linux based. So yeah, it's perfectly fine to be a Linux person at work at Microsoft. Um, now, uh, 
Uh, while I use Linux, my day-to-day -day workstations are all Macs. <laughs> so I'm talking to you from a Mac. I have a Mac in the back. This is another Mac. There's a Mac there, a Mac there, an iPad, another Mac there. So I'm surrounded by Macs here um, and a couple of uh, Linux VMs. And uh, so, yeah, it's perfectly fine. Yeah, perfectly fine. So, and uh, talking about Microsoft and working there, which is absolutely fine. Mm -hmm. So what is your, as you said, you mentioned it earlier, you're not anymore a dotnet person. So can you shed some light on what are you doing now? Oh, well, unless it's confidential. I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm, you know, once, the, once you work on dotnet, you'll always be a dotnet person. And I still work uh, with, uh, you know, with the team that does the planning and, uh, you know, tracks the progress of dotnet. But, uh, for the last year or so, um, I've mostly been working on, my focus has been on AI and AI runtimes. And, uh, and uh, so, yeah, I spent a lot of time. You'll see some of the work that we're doing. Uh, you know, if you keep track of F-sharp, you'll see some of the very exciting work that we're doing with, uh, with deep learning on F-sharp. And it is very interesting because um, in deep learning, there is uh, in deep learning there is this thing called the um, the backpropagation, and and the way that you have to compute the backpropagation to essentially train a model, right? And this relies on 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 applying. Uh, gradients to your value. I mean, I, I don't know if you guys are deep learning folks, but there's this process that it's that that folks have to do, and there's a couple of hacks. TensorFlow has one particular way of doing it, and they have an automated way and a kind of hacky way. And PyTorch has this. You know, they work. Uh, you know, I shouldn't call them hacks, but you know, if you if you're a software engineer, you look at what they're doing. It's like Jesus. Right, uh, this is not right, <laughs> but it works. Uh, so one of the things that we've been doing is in F sharp, there is this capability that allows us to do precise auto differentiation without resorting to these things that you know that work, but you know don't give you a good vibe. So uh, so with F sharp, we're actually able to do uh, this auto differentiation in a very reliable way. And additionally, it does something that most people struggle to do, and it has to do with the optimizer. The optimizer is something that you kind of fudge and you kind of tweak and you kind of try to teach it to do a good job at learning. And uh, there's all kinds of optimizers out there and with different hacks. and. You know, it's like, it's essentially like duct tape. So people are like, well, let's try this. Oh, it doesn't work. Let's, well, move it a little bit to the left. Well, move it a little bit to the right, right? And uh, and uh, what we're trying right now with F-sharp is, uh, is we believe that using forward differentiation, we can train the optimizer. So as part of the regular training process, not only you train your data set, you train your optimizer to be better, and essentially, we can reduce the amount of data that you need to train the same models at the, uh, the same quality. So that is the research direction that we're going on with that. It is fascinating piece of work uh, led by Don Sign. And the other thing that Don Sign is doing is, uh, in deep learning, essentially, you transform data. You have you have this data, you know, like an image, right? 1024 by 1024 by by let's say three channels, one for red, green, and blue. And uh, and then you apply all kinds of conversions and things and, and you teach and you teach it to do things, right? So you have convolutions or you know different things. And each one of these essentially transforms these uh, arrays, right? These very big arrays, like 1024, 1024 by three, and they transform into different shapes. And a big source of pain and problems that people have with deep learning is that they mess up the shapes, they mess up the convolutions, they mess up the padding, they mess up the uh, the, uh, the transformations, and and it's a source of bugs. Um, and there's really nothing that people can do uh, 
it's not like you get a runtime error that says, hey, you use the wrong shape. Instead, you get garbage, and you have to spend days trying to figure out why we got the garbage. You have no clue. You got to re review every single thing. It's like, did I get the data right? Is my algorithm right, or are my shapes wrong? You don't know. It's not like you can get an error because all transformations are valid. It's just some of them produce junk and other will work, <laughs> right? So it's a disaster. Um, so one of the nice things that Don has been working on is essentially doing shape checking on the IDE. So you're able to write, you're able to write uh, models and the IDE does the shape checking. And if you hover with the mouse on top of things, it tells you what are the shapes, what are the, how did the shapes get impaired? Uh, you can have not only static shapes like 1024 by 1024, but you could say width by height, and then we can do operations and do inference and report errors based on the kind of things that you have. So let's say they have a convolution of, of uh, you know, uh, seven by seven, and it turns out that, well, that's not gonna work with this image size without padding. So we can catch that sort of problems. So that is sort of a, uh, so, so I've been working in towards that problem, and uh, that's a public piece. And there's a not public piece that uh, you know, sadly, like we were talking before the, this meeting, you know, I, I can't really talk about for the next few years. And uh, but you know, it's all it's all fun and games in the AI space, and uh, runtimes in the AI space. Then we so it's a fascinating in... new world. The what? Yeah. We will meet in a few years, and then you will share what you've been working on uh, yeah, yeah, over yeah, these yeah. those years. Uh, so before you joined the Microsoft, there was this also a period in your life, I think it was before mm -hmm. you joined, when you was in the board of directors of the .NET Foundation, right? That's right, yes. So the .NET Foundation, to me, is a little bit uh, kind of a mysterious organization because, well, I, as a, pers as a developer, I'm kind of quite far from it and uh, yeah I see some meetups that are organized so but what is the role and uh, what what's your role there what is your like right goals so there? the first foundation I worked on was the GNOME Foundation and the GNOME Foundation was created as a public venue uh, for multiple companies uh, to come uh, in public sorry Miguel could you please move your camera a little bit because it's yeah you're what do uh, you yeah, fine. Absolutely. Yeah. So the foundations provide a public venue for companies to talk to each other. And uh, when we did the GNOME Foundation, this really obeyed to U.S. laws regarding antitrust. So, so it was necessary to have a foundation for those reasons. Now, Microsoft has tried to have different foundations for steering .NET and open source over the years. I don't know if you remember the Outer Curve Foundation, which I believe I might have been a board member too. Anyways, um, there were foundations where most of the control was with Microsoft and they were not really nonprofits. So um, I did not like the way that the .NET Foundation was structured a few years ago. And my, I think that my parting gift Right, my big contribution to the .NET Foundation was essentially to reshape the .NET Foundation to be like the GNOME Foundation, and what that means, what that means very specifically is, anybody that contributes to .NET, either code, documentation, evangelism, uh, QA, uh, support, anybody that feels that they're part of the .NET community can apply for membership anybody, right? And being a member gives you a vote, a vote to elect the board of directors. And the board of directors are the ones that steer the direction of the foundation. So it used to be a foundation that was mostly driven, uh, you know, by a desire to have one to promote the, the stack, but entirely controlled by Microsoft. And, you know, it would be something that somebody would do in their spare time. It was really not something that people were actively working on. So my parting gift, right, my last thing as a member of the .NET Board of Directors was to restructure the foundation so that, you know, I was appointed 
right? When I was on the board of directors of the foundation, I was appointed, Microsoft appointed me uh, as an external uh, board member before I joined Microsoft. And, uh, you know, it's it's an honor to, to do that, but I wanted this to be, to reflect the needs of the community and the desires of the community and really to be a, a foundation owned by the members. So my parting gift essentially is there's only one person appointed by Microsoft and they do have a veto power over license changes, right? You can't, you know, you cannot, for example, take all the .NET code and make it proprietary. So they do have that veto power. But other than that, all of the other members are elected now. And in fact, I decided to step down from the foundation and not run for the for the election. I felt that it would, you know, I felt that I had an unfair advantage uh, uh, at that point, and uh, and it was time for somebody else to step in. And I would be happy to coach new members of the foundation or board members into what they have to do. And I think they've been doing a great job. And uh, and now the foundation is is an open foundation, just like the Gnome Foundation. So. So that was my contribution, <laughs> uh, tearing down the existing foundation and make it more like an open source foundation. And now it's, uh, you know, it's all the people. I don't know if you guys contribute code or contribute emotions or, you know, this conference itself, uh, you should apply to be members if you're not members. And I know that there's a donation link, like, would you like to donate money to be a member? You can always say, I don't want to, and you can skip the donation. So, so there's no need to, to freak out over that. Okay, and we have seven minutes left. Mm -hmm. And the last question is about takeaways. So you have a very rich big software development background. You tried a mm -hmm. lot of different technologies. You worked at many different companies. And maybe you have some very smart thoughts that you want to share with our audience, uh, some useful things that you want to advise young developers uh, or yourself? Uh, yeah. 20. Well, I think uh, the two recommendations that I have, um, there are two books that have really helped me a lot. And some of those you sort of know intuitively, right? As software developers, software developers, we have found that it's incredibly addictive, right? Once you get good at writing code, you're like super addicted to it. And uh, and you get into this place where you're writing code and building worlds and making things happen. And it's so exciting. And we kind of know where that comes from. We, we just got into it and and uh, and, uh, and, uh, and we just roll with it. But it turns out that there's a, a, a psychologist that studied this behavior. And the same thing that makes you a good programmer can help you be good at almost anything in life. Um, I can't pronounce his name, so you're going to have to forgive me because it's a very complicated uh, name. Um, but the work, the, the work that he did is called The Psychology of Flow. Flow. And he has a book on this, and then he wrote a bunch of follow-up books on different ways of exploring it. But it essentially explains how humans... Uh, get better at things. Uh, he tried to study what caused people to be bored, uh, what gave people anxiety, what made people happy, uh, what got people excited or, uh, or feel challenged or depressed or, you know, or, or, or struggled. And it turns out that there's, you know, for different activities, there's a way of getting yourself excited about that. And it's called the psychology of flow and it goes into the details of how this works. So, I love that one. So if you ever think that, uh, you know, if you're feeling unhappy, that is a great book. And it helps you not just with coding, it helps you with cooking, it helps you with sports, it helps you with reading, it helps you with writing, it helps you with almost everything. So you should really take a look at that book. Uh, it's called The Psychology of Flow. And like I said, it's a, let me see, should I try to pronounce his name? Definitely. I'm going to see if I can... Mihaly, oh, I'm, I'm going to butcher it up. Um, I'm going to butcher his name up. Mihaly 
Sik Sent Mihagi. Oh, it's terrible. I cannot pronounce it. Uh, I'll send you the link, but Mihaly. Okay. okay, I think he might be. What, what do you think? Is he, is he Polish or is he Russian, actually? Where is he from? Anyways, and then um, uh, the other one is called the Art of Possibility, which is uh, uh, which is a book. Oh, he's Hungarian, um, which is a book about uh, a guy that uh, he's a conductor of the Boston uh, Philharmonic, and uh, I met that guy at a conference, and uh, he was supposed to do a talk at one p.m. or something. And he never showed up. And after dinner, we were having dinner, and they said, all right, before we go to sleep, it's like, hey, this guy is just here. And uh, he's going to do his talk that was scheduled for 1 p.m. You should all go there. And it was a mind-blowing uh, presentation. Um, and it changed my view on what is possible and what is not possible. And the sort of thing that, you know, a lot of the negative impressions or this, you know, software programmers are particularly pedantic. Right, because you know we're, we're we're we learn to deal with compiler errors, to off by one errors by, you know we need to be very precise in the way we communicate. Uh, we try to find defects in everything because we're thinking like compilers, right? Um, and uh, and that is not very useful, <laughs> right? It's useful when you're writing code, but it's not useful in life, and it's not useful when you're planning projects. So, the art of possibility is a fantastic book. Uh, that helps you rethink how you should approach problem solving. So um, those would be my two recommendations to new developers or to anybody really. And uh, you know, even if you're not a developer today, or even if you're you know just an artist and you want to get started in coding or you want to get started in uh, become a chef, both of those books will be great for you. So, anyways, that would be my recommendation. Thank you. That was very interesting. And we still have a little bit of time, and I have a, a very small and uh, maybe a little bit surprising question to you, which you may mm -hmm. try to answer very shortly. So we know that you wrote a lot of different software. You are uh, managing people, or you were managing people. You made different things like .NET Foundation. But what are your hobbies? Oh, I like to write code. No, no, no. <laughs> uh, what are my hobbies? Um, I, well, I like, I, like I said, I have three kids, uh, years 10, seven, and four. So I, I try to spend as much time as I can. It's surprisingly how quickly uh, time passes, right? My 10-year-old uh, is almost behaving like a teenager and, uh, you know, uh, argues with me and gets upset with me. And so, and it felt like she was born only yesterday, so time flies. So I'm trying to spend, you know, as much as time as I can with them. Of course, the pandemic has made this mandatory, right? <laughs> but I guess yeah. uh, spending time with the kids, uh, spending time with the kids is uh, it's one of my hobbies. Uh, okay. In the and evenings, I try to code. Yeah, that's a good answer from the developer. Okay, thank you, Miguel. Uh, we are on time. Thank and, you so much. Uh, thank you for joining us. Uh, now that's the end of the uh, track one first slot here, and we are now switching to the next uh, block of the information.